Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Good to uh, look into God's Word with you again today. So I'm going to ask that you turn with your Bi- in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs 19, we're going to look at verses 20 to 24. You're using the uh, Bibles that are there on the table there. Uh, it's page 930, page 930, Proverbs 19, verse 20 to to 24. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about uh, perseverance uh, today. And if at the you know if you know you, you sometimes you read a, uh, one of these self help books or these uh, you go to some conference where there's this motivational speaker and you come away from that and you think oh if I just try harder. Um, and uh, just uh, uh, put a little bit more effort into, into things. And if you come away from this message really saying, hey, you know, it's just all about my effort, what I do, then, then I've blown it. <laughs> I, I, want you to, I want you really to, to um, uh, take to heart the words of Hebrews chapter 12, where it talks about persevering, right? And, and it says, uh, set aside the things uh, that entangle you, set aside the sin that entangles, put, set aside the, the, the things that, that hinder you in your walk, and, and fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And that's where I want your focus to be on today, as we, as we talk about perseverance. It's not just about our pushing through to the end, but it's our fixing our eyes on, on Christ. Uh, Let's pray together, and then we'll look at this text together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to, to live and to die for us. Praise you for his resurrection, that he's seated at your right hand, that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame is now at your right hand. We praise you that uh, he is the one who has begun our faith and the one who will finish that faith and complete it to the very end. And uh, today, as we look into your word, we want to find fresh strength, fresh motivation, fresh encouragement, fresh joy, fresh peace, fresh hope in your, in your truth that will sustain us for this coming week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you ever feel like change and progress happen too slowly? When you look at the world, um, does it ever seem like justice is slow in coming. Wrongs are not righted. The weak and the vulnerable continue to be exploited. People cheat and lie their way to the top. Uh, In in Proverbs, we're told that there are consequences to our actions, but in the world, it seems like the despots thrive and the needy languish. Life remains unfair for for many people. So we look at the world, we see that, and we say justice seems so slow. And then we look at our own at our own lives, and uh, you know we may try to do what's right and find that it gets it gets us no nowhere. Uh, we want to do things God's way, to be holy, to do good, to seek justice, and yet the people we've been praying for remain stubbornly unchanged, or that difficult circumstance that we've been um, stuck in, continues to to bring pain and discouragement, even after years and years of crying and trying, we're still there. Is there everything like change is slow? A lot of our anger and our resentment, a lot of our quarreling and our disputes arise because we're frustrated with the slowness of change. And so we look for shortcuts. We, we're tempted to abandon God's path. All right, if, if this is God's path, it's, 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 it's way too slow. Let me speed things up a little bit. And so we want to give up or we become apathetic or we lash out at God and, 
at those around us. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 20, we are encouraged not to stray from God's path, but instead to, to hold tenaciously to God's word and to walk patiently in his way, in the way of Christ. It says, listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. We've often encountered this instruction in the book of Proverbs where we are told to be good listeners. If you want to be wise, you need a teachable spirit, one that is willing to be instructed, and you need a humble heart, one that is able to be corrected. And so listen, listen to counsel, be willing to receive discipline. And when we do so, we will find that, that godly wisdom stands the test of time. And at the end, we will be considered wise. Uh, Bruce Waltke, Waltke says that that phrase, at the end, points to the final outcome of our way of life. It points to the end. When we stand before God in eternity, we will be counted among the wise. And that's what ultimately matters, all right, to be wise in God's eyes. Not to be wise in anybody else's eyes. That's not the main thing. The main thing is to be wise in the eyes of, of God. But there are also present-day implications to this. If we listen to wise counsel and we accept godly discipline, then we will grow in wisdom throughout our life, throughout this journey, and into our later years. Wisdom is this long-term investment that we make. As, um, as Peter Lighthart puts it, the early trajectory toward wisdom pays off for decades after. Um, especially if you're wise, if you're young here today, right? That investment in wisdom pays dividends all through your life for decades and decades and decades to the very end. And so that phrase at the end reminds us to persist in a wise life, to keep on practicing patient obedience to the instructions of wisdom, even when life is unfair, even when life is unjust. Um, and, and then, you know, when we, when we say that, we say, okay, wh what does that look like? What is that kind of life of... The, that kind of persistence and perseverance, that patience, what does that look like? And in verses 21 through 24, there are four pieces of counsel that help us to stay focused on the end game of wisdom when we stand before God. Wisdom throughout our life and wisdom when we stand before God. Verses 21 to 24, many other plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails what a person desires is unfailing love, better to be poor than a liar. The fear of the Lord leads to life, then one t rests content, untouched by trouble. A sluggard buries, buries his hand in the dish, he will not even bring it back to his mouth. There is a long-term perspective in these verses, an implicit perseverance to be wise at the end. Here's my summary of these, uh, these four verses. If we're going to be wise at the end, we have to, number one, be confident in God's purposes. Number two, we have to be constant in, in steadfast love. Number three, we have to be content in godly fear. And number four, we have to be conscientious in diligent work. Those four things in these verses. What does a life of persistence and perseverance and patience look like? These four things. Right, so number one, be confident in God's purposes. As we long for change, as we wait for justice, as we endure hardship, we need, we need to remember that the Lord's sovereignty, in the midst of all those difficulties, he reigns over all of it, over every struggle that we encounter. Proverbs 19, verse 21 again. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes that prevails. It's, this, is, this is not saying that it's wrong for you to plan. Right? In, in fact, 
I would put it to you that the, the reason we have many plans in our hearts is because God designed us that way. God made us to make plans. He, he, he shaped us and he, and he, and he, and he made us in a, in a way that, that uh, we, we want to plan. Um, and if that's the case, then waiting on God and trusting his sovereignty doesn't mean we glide passively through life and just say, oh, whatever happens, what happens, right? It's not like going down a lazy river where you just sit back and allow, every, allow the, the, the water to, to carry you along. We're to make plans. We accomplish things in this world by making plans. We love people by making plans. But our many plans can include plans for good, and they can include plans for evil. We ought to make plans for good because we, we, we want to love our neighbor, we want to promote the well-being of others, and when we do that, this verse encourages us to trust God with those plans. Don't, don't put your confidence in the ingenuity and thoroughness of, 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 of your uh, plans. And I know some of you don't, don't like to make plans, and some of you are like, I got to plan every single de detail. Don't put your, your confidence in the thoroughness of your plans. Don't put your confidence in how, how much of a genius you are at, at everything, at putting it all together and figuring it all out. And I've got all the details. And at 2 o'clock tomorrow, I'm going to do this. And at 2.15, I'm going to do that. And, Put your confidence in Christ, in God's sovereignty. So even when our plans don't work out, when or how we want, we keep looking to God in faith. Rather than shaking our fist at God, we wait on him. We may be bewildered. We may grieve. We may even have a season of doubt where we say, God, I, I was doing this for you. I had this all thought out as to, as you know, these plans are, are to, to help that, that neighbor in need. These plans were, were for your glory, for your, for your honor, and, and I don't understand why, why it's all fallen apart. And, and where are you, God? We may go through a season where we struggle. But the, in the end, our confidence needs to be that God's purposes will prevail. His purposes, not ours. And in faith, we hold that that is a good thing. We hold that it is a good thing that his purposes prevail and not ours, no matter how good our intentions. One article says it like this. Knowing our own limitations, why would we want to believe that our will might actually have the final say. We do not know everything. We're often deceived, and sometimes the goals that we achieve end up bringing with them harmful consequences that we never anticipated. Given this reality, we should desire only for the will of a perfect being to be accomplished in every circumstance. Makes sense, right? Unfortunately, not only do people make good plans, they also make evil plans. And if you are scheming an evil plan today, uh, you need to repent of that, right? If, if you have some plans today for, for harm, for, for, for hurting someone, um, the call of scriptures is, is, to, is to repent and turn from that. But what about those times when evil plans are made against us and they threaten to undermine us, to, to harm us. Again, this verse encourages us to put our trust, our confidence in God. We want to retaliate and get even when others plan to hurt us. Or we allow that hurt to simmer in us until we become increasingly bitter against God, against, against people, against the world. And Proverbs 19 verse 21 is meant to remind us that there's this bigger picture, this longer perspective, so that we will cling to the Lord. 
Even if the plans against us are many, attacking from all sides, we're reminded that, that God's good pleasure will ultimately come to pass. So as Joseph said to his brothers, right after they had uh, plotted against him, you intended to harm me. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Think also of the greater example of Jesus. The Apostle Peter spoke of God's purpose prevailing even though the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders, the, the Roman soldiers, the authorities were able to carry out their plans to, to kill Jesus. Even though they did all of that, Peter says this, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Messiah. God's purposes will prevail. We put our confidence in that. And so the, the encouragement here is for us to be patient and to persevere because God is still on the throne. He's in charge. He will accomplish his plans for our good and for his glory. Be confident. Secondly, be constant in steadfast love. Proverbs 19, verse 22. What a person desires is unfailing love. Better to be poor than a liar. The deep longing of, of the human heart is to be loved with an unfailing love, a steadfast love. A word that means loving kindness, loyalty, one that, that doesn't give up. Paul Tripp writes this. He says, there are two questions that every human being everywhere has asked, regardless of race, ethnicity, geography, history, age, economic, or social status. These are the two questions. Will someone love me? And number two, Number two, once they get to know me, will they still love me? Will someone love me? And number two, once they get to know me, will they still love me? And ultimately, the love that every person hungers for is found in God who describes himself in Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7, as the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, in this unfailing chesed, steadfast love. Abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love, this unfailing love, to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebelling rebellion and sin. This God has demonstrated his steadfast love by sending his own son to be the sacrificial offering that takes away our sins. This, this God has, has, from the very beginning of creation, steadfastly, unfailingly, brought about this plan of his by which the world might be redeemed, by which your sins, my sins, might be forgiven. We might be made right with God. Last week at our youth Bible study, we, we pointed to, to Genesis chapter 3. And in the cursing of Satan, and in the cursing of, of Eve, and in the cursing of, of Adam, there is in that, in, in, in all of those curses, one little, one little, inkling of the gospel. I will put enmity between, between you, your seed, and the seed of the woman. And from the very beginning, steadfastly, 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 un, unfailingly, God brings about his plan to demonstrate his love. For you and me.
to quote Paul Tripp again, what every human heart longs for is the love of God. Only his sacrificial, forgiving, accepting, patient, kind, merciful, wise, and faithful love will ever satisfy the longing of our hearts. The love we desire is ultimately God's love. But that doesn't mean human love is unnecessary or unimportant because what we also desire is to find sacrificial, forgiving, accepting, patient, kind, merciful, wise, and faithful love in the people around us. We long for that unfailing, steadfast love. As someone has put it, to have skin on. In fact, God desires the same thing of us. He wants to find in us that kind of steadfast love for others. That's why the second half of verse 22 talks about uh, um, uh, the fact that it is better to be poor than a liar. This this is God's desire. This This is his moral system. This is his values, all right? He he says steadfast love is more valuable than material wealth. The mention of the poor in this context suggests that the liar is someone who uses deceit for their own gain. The the liar is not steadfast in his love. They they may at first come along and say, hey, I'm your friend, I'm I'm here for you. um, And and then when when the opportunity comes, when the time comes, they lie to get something from you. This is someone who's who's not faithful, they're faithless, they don't keep their word, but they're willing even to lie on the witness stand in order to make money at another person's expense. This person loves money more than he loves people, and God says he opposes this way of treating people, which is why he says it's better to be poor than to be a promise-breaking, trust-breaching liar. And so the path that God calls us to live on is this, is this path, path of love, which is his path of love, right? It's, the, it's to reflect who he is. It's to, it's to show others around us what is, what is this steadfast love that, that God has shown to you? What, is that, what does that look like? And, and, and it's, it's our responsibility to live that out, to show the people around us. This is what the steadfast love, unfailing love of God looks like and so we love people and he wants us to stay on that path to remain loyal to remain steadfast to remain unfailing in love it doesn't mean that we're pushovers it doesn't mean that love isn't tough at times it's not this wishy-washy washy type of love it's not this this type of, of of love where oh whatever you want type of thing but it's a genuine type of love the kind of love that God loved us with Just as God loved us in Christ with an everlasting love, we're to love others with a steadfast faithfulness. Don't don't stray from that path into falsehood, but persevere in love. Think of the people in your life. Who is there that needs you to stand with them today? Think about the people in your life. Who is there that needs you to stand with them today? Who is there that needs you to stick by them today, to love them with an unfailing love? In Christ, by the power of his spirit, we are equipped, we are enabled to love as God has loved us. Be steadfast, be constant in love. Number three, be content in godly fear. I suspect that we don't usually associate contentment with fear, and yet this next proverb says, the fear of the Lord leads to life, then one rests content, untouched by trouble. The the fear of the Lord is such an important concept in Proverbs, in the Bible, and yet for me at least, it is one of these extremely hard things to describe and to define. We generally think of, of fear as a negative emotion. Right? Um, when it comes to, to, 
to fear, we run away from um, what, we, what we're afraid of. Right? We avoid those things. Right? So, that, so the last um, few months, I've been taking, um, I've been flying out to Halifax a fair bit to see uh, first my mom and then my dad uh, now. And um, uh, one of the things I, I sometimes do because it's just, uh, it's just cheaper is I take the train down to Toronto and then I take the, the, the Up Express up to the airport to fly out to Halifax. And uh, as you take the train into, into Toronto, you go by the CN Tower. And uh, as, you, as, you, as you go by, they had this new experience. Have any of you seen this? It's called the Edge Walk. Right? So you go up to the top of the tower, and they strap you into, they, stra they better strap you into these harnesses, and you go outside of the tower, and you walk around on the outside, and you see people leaning over the edge. Right? There are people who want to walk towards the edge. I want to walk away. Um, that's, that's, that's how we deal with fears. We want to avoid them. We want to, we want to stay away. We want to run away from them as fast as possible. When I was in high school, I, I had a fear of public speaking, so I avoided all the classes where I had to, where I had to say something out, you know, publicly. We avoid those things that we're afraid of. So when we come to the fear of the Lord, we take that common conception of fear and we bring that over to the fear of the Lord and we say, how does that, how does that fit? How does that fit? We have this negative idea of being scared of God especially his judgment. and We want to run away from him. But the Bible doesn't speak of the fear of the Lord in those terms. It speaks of the fear of the Lord in, in, in a way that, that's almost positive, encourages us to trust the Lord, to revere him. And, and it, it, it's, it's not that, it's almost like it's, it, it's not primarily about being scared of him. And don't misunderstand me here. God is very scary at times, right? So don't misunderstand. God is very, very scary at times. But the, the weird thing is this. When we truly fear the Lord, we don't run away from him. We run towards him. When we truly fear the Lord, we don't avoid him. We want to be with him as much as possible. So what's going on here? John Murray describes it like this. The fear of God in which godliness consists is the fear which constrains, compels adoration and love. It is, it is the fear which consists in awe, reverence, honor, and worship. And all of these on the highest level of exercise, it is the reflex in our consciousness of the transcendent majesty and holiness of God. It is the reflex in our consciousness. What is he saying there? I think this is really key. This, is, this for me is really kind of, kind of gelled, captured what it means to, to fear God, even though I can't fully describe and define it. Right? So to fear God is our reflexive response to God when we encounter him as he truly is. It, is. it is something built into us as to how we, we respond to God. In his greatness and his goodness, in his holiness and in his perfection, the fear of the Lord is that, is that response when we recognize God is God, he alone is God, and I am not. I am not.
not, but he is. And as a result, we are humble before him. We are devoted to him, and we are obedient to him. So coming back to this verse, when, um, when we encounter the Lord and we respond to him with that proper fear, it, it leads to life, this verse says, which is further described as a deep contentment. To rest content has the idea of, of abiding through the night, satisfied. Think of all the things that keep you up at night, anxious and restless. Think of all the dissatisfaction that plagues us. You know, uh, the fear of missing out, the, the fear of failure, the fear of, of shame, the fear of being wrong, the fear of, of rejection, the fear of making decisions, and, and just so many fears in our lives that keep us awake at night. I, called my, I got home last night, and, I, and the, one of the first things I did was I called my dad. Why? Because if I didn't, he would spend the night worried that my plane had gone down. So many things that, that plague us with fear. But when we have godly fear, all these other fears are quieted. Okay. They may not go away, but they are quieted. This verse suggests that the fear of the Lord is enough. Everything else will eventually leave you discontent. But to be humbly obedient and wholeheartedly devoted, devoted to the Lord is fully satisfying. We can rest in it. No longer driven by fear to make faithless and self-centered schemes. But content, resting in it. Eugene Peterson says it like this, practicing the fear of the Lord gradually but surely shifts our attention from a preoccupation with what we can or should do to an attentive absorption in what God has been doing and the way he continues doing it in Jesus by the Holy Spirit. It's shifting my, I'm preoccupied with this thing. It's, it's on my mind every single moment of every day. And then slowly and gradually my attention is shifted to the God who is God. That's the fear of the Lord. You see what's going on here? When we fear God, our attention is focused on all that he is. His beauty and strength, his power and gentleness, his justice and grace, his transcendence and eminence, and so much more. All that he is, and, and then knowing that in Christ, he is all that he is, for us. He is all that he is for us. Can you not rest content in that? Can we not rest? He is all that he is for us. In Christ. We don't have to figure it all out ourselves. We don't have to pursue our own path. We can be satisfied on God's path. Assured that it leads to life. To the rich satisfaction of being fully alive. And ultimately, to eternal life. Finally, be conscientious and diligent work. When we, when we talk about work here, it's not just your job. It's all your God-given roles and responsibilities, especially the responsibility to love God, to love your neighbor. So in contrast to the God-fearer in verse 23, who is satisfied and content, we now meet a sluggard who is starving even though his hand is elbow deep in a plate of food. Verse 24, um, a sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He will not even bring it back to his mouth. Resting in the Lord is not the same as being careless or being lazy and careless. Resting in the Lord is not passivity. 
It is not doing the least amount of work possible. It, it involves being diligent in our responsibilities with the abilities that Christ has given to us by his spirit. So Solomon paints this rather absurd little picture in this verse. In the ancient world, people generally ate with their hands rather than using utensils. And the image of, is, here is, is of a person, um, he, he goes to pick up his ne next hand, handful, his next mouthful of food, so he puts his hand down in there. Um, he, you know, he, he's hungry, and so he takes that first step to satisfy his hunger. But then he stops, and he leaves his hand in his, in his bowl. And you say, that's, that's absurd. It, it, in our culture, it, we would say, um, you know, um, leaving your, your soup in your in your, leaving your spoon in your soup or the steak in the knife or the, 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 the fork in the pie. Um, and, and it's just, just this very um, extreme exaggeration. And we say, well, nobody is that lazy. And the point is to say to us, listen, you, you, you see that, you say, that is, <laughs> you laugh at that, and you say, that is totally absurd, and, and yet... If you give up on your responsibilities before God, that is just as absurd. You need to, you need to feel that. You need, to, you need to sense it just how absurd that is. Because in light of all that God has promised at the end, why would we not finish what we started? Why would we not finish? There is a joy in serving people. There is, a, there is a goodness in loving our neighbor. There is a, there is a peace in pleasing God. There is, a, there is an eternal inheritance for those who work wholeheartedly for Christ. And we want to have the life of God filled with his goodness. Then we need to work diligently with the spiritual energy that he gives and finish, and finish what has been started. As one devotional book urges us, stir up your love for the people who would, who would benefit from it, from it. Look to the finisher of our faith and finish it. Finish it. Yes, the road is long and winding. No, we're not there yet. Yes, the work is difficult. No, there aren't any shortcuts. Yes, the needs seem never-ending. Nonetheless, we are, urged, we are urged here, persevere in our God-given responsibilities. Even though the progress often seems super, super slow, be diligent, plan, and work in submission to God's will. Live purposefully under God's direction. Moving my dad into a nursing home tomorrow. And I, and, I, and I said to him yesterday, Dad, you, you need to have a reason to get up every morning. Dad, you've been wanting to write that book about mom's early life all these years. Do it. Write that book. Tell about mom's early years. I don't know if I'll do it. But live purposefully under God's direction. Keep on doing what he's called you to do. Be, be conscientious in doing his work. In the days following my mom's death, I thought about how much the book of Proverbs, of all books, the book of Proverbs, um, prepared me to face the reality of her death with the hope of eternity. I've been surprised, really, by how much this, this book is eternity-focused. A number of years ago, I, I preached through Ecclesiastes. Some people say Ecclesiastes is really depressing. 
because the preacher repeatedly says in that book, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. And you would think that um, from a biblical perspective anyway, the main takeaway of such a despairing message is to long for eternity. If everything under the sun is meaningless and frustrating, then, then, we should, then we should look for hope beyond this world. And yet my takeaway from that book was to be thankful for each day that God has given to us right now. And in the fear of the Lord, to enjoy the good gifts that he has given us today. That was my takeaway from the book. And then I come to Proverbs. And, you know, Proverbs has been looked to as this self-help type of book that equips us to live well in this world. Wisdom is grounded in, the, in the, the fabric of God's created order. It's about living well in God's world, under God's rule. And yet, I've discovered in preaching through this book that, um, that um, uh, I have a greater longing for eternity not a greater attachment to this world. That's because one of the underlying implications of, of the promises in Proverbs is that they will not be fully realized until the new heaven and the new earth are established. And so the, so the book keeps our eyes focused on the goal. Christ has walked this path. He learned wisdom from Proverbs, and he lived it, and he pursued it to the very end. We fix our eyes on Jesus, and we fix our eyes on the goal that he set before us. This book urges us not to stray from the path, to stay doing what is right, stay doing what is just, even when it all seems futile, stay faithful to God's way. When change in the world, when change in other people, when change especially in ourselves is slow, 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 don't give up. Don't give up. Keep on being confident in God's purposes. Keep on being steadfast in love, keep on being content in godly fear and the fear of the Lord. Keep on being conscientious in all the responsibilities God has given to you. And at the end, you will be counted among the wise. Let's pray together. For the joy set before him, Lord Jesus, you endured all the suffering for us. For that same joy, united in you, for that same joy, Lord, help us to persevere. To not to stray from the path of wisdom that you've set out before us but to keep on doing what is right, keep on doing what is just for the good of our neighbors and for the glory of your name. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.